Hello. How's it going? I'm going to wait for my slides. There it is. Perfect. Hello, everyone. My name is Johan Gorsny, and I am a co-founder and technical lead at Zirkit. And I am here to talk to you today about EIP 7702, which you may know a little bit about, or maybe you don't. This is mostly for the people who don't. But if you uh, do know something about it, maybe you'll still learn something and uh, still find it interesting. So without uh, further ado, let's get into it. So. The boring technical details, or as sort of the details of the EIP, um, which aren't that technical. Uh, what is it? The vital information. What does EIP 7702 do? Well, it is an EIP that's uh, about setting an EOA account code. That's the name of it. And it's authored by a bunch of you know, well-known people or, or established uh, researchers in the space. And one thing I really want to highlight here is that on that list of authors, which is a great list of authors, I'm not on it. So if I say anything wrong, I apologize. Please you know, call me out on that later. But uh, you know, hopefully it's all still good. And just if I do misspeak, this is exactly why. But anyways, the EIP aims to add a new transaction type where you can set account codes for EOAs. It's been out for a couple of. Uh, you know, not quite a couple of years, but a couple of half years maybe in, in terms of uh, drafts. And it's actually going to be included in the upcoming Pector release of Ethereum. Um, so it's a pretty core um, EIP that everyone's going to have on Ethereum L1, and then probably shortly after on a bunch of L2s uh, as soon as it goes live, which is um, something we'll talk about a little bit later in terms of the release timelines and things like this. So why do we want it? Why do we care about EIP 7702? Well, we wanted a better user experience. That's the full sort of short version of this. We wanted something that we could do many different um, transactions at once on chain for a bunch of reasons. So for example, right now, if you want to deal with sending someone in ERC-20, if you don't know them, if you've never dealt with it before, you have to approve your spend, and then you have to actually spend it. This is really annoying. Uh, and it requires doing multiple transactions. And you know they might hit the chain at different times. Things might happen weirdly. It's not great. If only you could do it all at once. In fact, that's one of the goals of uh, VIP 7702 and one of the things you can do. So you can batch transactions. But once you start going down this rabbit hole of what type of UX you want to improve for end users, you actually want to do um, other things, too. There's a bunch of use cases you can do with arbitrary code attached to an EOA. Um, and two of the more popular ones are sponsorship. So I could sponsor someone else's transaction. I could say, I'll pay for my colleague or my friend's um, transfer or smart contract call or something like this. And that's really helpful for onboarding people. Um, if people are new, they don't have ETH, maybe this will help them get some ETH. It's also really good if I'm a DAP, uh, because maybe I want to sponsor transactions that will target my DAP, and I will gain users as a result of it. Um, so there's a lot of benefits of doing this. Also great for things like L2s, where we can sponsor onboarding onto our chain. One of the reasons that Zirkit here is also interested in it. Um, but you can also do other cool stuff. You can do things like privilege, privilege de-escalation, where you sort of assign different subsets of your sort of account to different people based on the logic you give in that code. Essentially, you can say someone that I know has a key that can only do certain things with my account and not everything, while others can do different things. So you can imagine one of my friends could spend my USDC, and the other could only spend my USDT or something like this. Um, how we'd actually do this is you know, subject to the code, and we'll talk a little bit more in the future, but keep all of these things in mind. Part of the reason I wanted to give this talk is not because this topic isn't uh, already been covered by a couple of people. It certainly has. There was a great talk at DevCon, for example, by one of the authors, like Lance. But the other one is that we're at the beginning of Build Week here at e Denver, and honestly, it's a hackathon. So if you're looking for things to hack, one of the things that would be really interesting is figuring out ways to use the IP7702 set codes as um, you know, an interesting project. And I think that's sort of the, the moment to do it is right now before Pector comes live, but while the protocol is still you know, relatively final. And if you do this, you'll be building into this sort of larger notion of uh, account abstraction. So um, EIP 7702 is one step towards uh, this notion of account abstraction where we don't sort of need to know that the EOA is in fact an EOA rather than a multisig or something like this. But essentially, you know, at the Ethereum Foundation, uh, or at least the Ethereum website, uh, defines account abstraction as um, flexibili flexib flexibly program more security and better user experiences into the accounts. And that's sort of what I said with batches and, and sponsorship and uh, pr privilege de-escalation. But essentially, you want to be able to do stuff where the dApps that receive transactions from the transactions don't know if it's an e EOA or another smart contract. And honestly, they don't really care. They just do what they're supposed to do. And this is only one step because this is not quite native. Um, this is, in fact, something you have to do separately through the set code transaction type that I alluded to in the last slide. Um, and it's not uh, native in the sense that you still have to do this. You 
would like to have full AA on Ethereum, or at least many people would. Um, and this won't get us there, but it will get us part of the way there. And until we have that full, all the way native account abstraction, this is a pretty good starting point where we can start to get users um, ready for the notion that they could have a smart contract wallet that can do some of the things that they would do maybe by default in the future. So this is a really good stepping stone. And it's important to note that I'll, uh, this approach is not uh, incompatible with other approaches towards account abstraction like uh, EIP-4437 or um, other things that have been looked at. So if you hear all of these words, this is one good starting place. And this is, again, why I want to bring it up at this hackathon. So you can start building something, something that works, something that's interesting, and takes us in uh, to the direction of, of the future Ethereum chain itself anyways. So. Let's dive a little bit deeper into some of these use cases, because I think the motivation is actually really, really important. And a lot of people gloss over it because this topic's fairly old. Um, in fact, AA has been sort of a hot topic for two or three years, if not longer. And although 7702 only sort of got draft status um, last year, I think, uh, you know, AA has been around. So let's look at some of the critical use, use cases. First, batching. I've already said the case of the ERC-20s with the approve and the spend. This is, I think, one of the easiest things you can fix to get users on, onto the chain. Most end users, you know, if they only come from Web2 or Cash or Visa, don't understand the need to approve. They just go and they spend the money and it's all good. Doing this atomically would be very good. You could, you know, alternatively not go down this route and require people to deploy their own smart contracts to do this, but that's a real pain and that's why we don't want that. Um, but you can also do things like trades. You can also think of more critical sort of infrastructure upgrades. So if you have a big DAP and you need to deploy a new proxy and then initialize it before it's front run, that might be really problematic if you can't do things in batches atomically. EIP 7702 allows people to do this with the right code. The next major use case I think is really, really interesting is this notion of sponsorship where people will pay for your gas or you'll pay for someone else's gas. Um, this is helpful, I think, for onboarding a bunch of people because now you can build apps where if you're willing to pay for you know, the on-chain costs of some users, those users don't even need to be really touching um, a KYC process or maybe they do, I don't know, I'm not a lawyer, but they don't need to have Ether in their account. They can you know, just have an account made, an address, and you can pay for their, um, their on-chain transactions. And this means as a dApp developer, you sort of get closer to that web to seamless thing where you just say log in and everything just works. And maybe you still need an address, so maybe it's not 100% you know, just click here and log in and there's no web three stuff, but it's a lot simpler. This also means that um, infrastructure projects like Zerkit, where we're building a rollup, um, can sponsor their users to get people on, on chain to do particular things or just anything we want. So this is really cool. And this is not limited to just ETH, right? You can sponsor things um, in other ways as well. Uh, you could sponsor people's on-chain transactions, which are paid in ETH, but you could say that those persons should pay you back in USDC or some other currency or off-chain favors or whatever you want. So I think it's really cool. But the the list of uh, use cases does not stop there. Um, one of the next big use cases is the idea of enhanced safety. What you could actually do is have part of your um, account code talk to a smart contract that will allow some level of social recovery. That is, you know, if you lose your part of your key to that account, um, there might be a multi-sig attached where if you can go talk to the other people who hold, you know, that type of privilege or those types of sub-keys, um, they can say, oh yeah, actually, well, that is, you know, the person, so I'm going to give back privilege to that account and we're good. And that's really, really cool because this is also another feature that scares a lot of people who aren't Web3 native, right? If you lose your private keys, it's over. Here, maybe we can do better. We can build it in a little bit more. And that's really, really exciting. And this sort of brings us to this notion of session keys and, and revocability. If you like those people and you want them to always have the ability to socially recover your account, that's great. If you don't, you can also make it so that those keys and those privileges expire over time or you can revoke them. And this means you can sort of do things like approvals that are a little bit more general, not just for tokens, but for actions and sort of general sequences of, of things arbitrary code. Uh, and then you can revoke them at certain times. So this is really helpful for building out um, different ways to sort of put yourself partially uh, in the hands of someone else without giving up entire trust. So this is really cool. So I did say it was an introduction. It's a bit technical. Let's go a little bit into it. What the, EOA, uh, sorry, what the EIP does is introduce a new account, trans account type. Uh, sorry, a new transaction type. And the transaction type is called a set code transaction. Uh, it's Built on previous work, um, EIP 2718, 
introduce the ability to new, add new transaction types. And so here we're building on that and we're using it. And that's not super important, so let's keep, a little, keep going a little bit. But essentially, you get this new transaction. And the transaction contains a whole bunch of things like this. And I'm not going to go through every single one of these. This is definitely helpful if you're going to try to implement some of these things on uh, this hackathon or beyond. But um, there's a couple of things that are really, really important I'll dive into. So at a glance, there's sort of stuff you'd expect, a chain ID and a nonce. This has to come from the people you know, signing this transaction and, and submitting it on the right chain, if that's appropriate, um, gas and all of that. And then there's one really, really interesting parameter, which I've highlighted here in green. And that is the authorization list. The authoriz authorization list is actually where all of the magic happens for IP7702. So let's look deeper into it. The authorization list has um, a couple things in it. It's a list of lists. And um, the inner list has a chain ID. It has an address, a nonce, and a Y, R, and S. So what those things are um, is a way to set up other people's privileges for you to do, I'm oh sorry, set up other people's privileges to act on your behalf. And the chain ID and address are somewhat st straightforward. The chain ID should match the chain you're putting this, con uh, this transaction on, but you can set it to zero so it can be replayed, subject to some sort of caveats, or caveats, sorry. Uh, and then the rest of it is a signature that actually comes from you. So when you create this entry in such a list, you sign it, and we sign it with your public key, and you can recover this from the RNS values. And then what, what happens is the address there um, is actually entitled to act on, on your behalf. And that's, that's really cool. Now, it's got to be non-zero. And why it's cool that you can do this by just signing this entry is that this means someone else can actually submit this transaction for you. You don't even have to pay for the transaction to set your account code. You just need to ha sign the tuple here, and it'll go through, which is really cool. Some technical details has got to be non-zero. No surprise. Wouldn't be very helpful if it was zero. Um, but essentially what happens is that this, we call this a delegation, yeah, dele delegation designator, where we have um, some ability to say that the code that's in that delegation designator will be run when someone else who you've delegated um, wants to run the code. And the person who you then allow to act on your behalf runs the code that you point to in this list, and everything kind of just works out. So actually, you can load an arbitrary code. There's smart contracts you can point to, and it'll be copied in. It's not quite exactly the same as normal deployment. Um, you have to call an initialization call, I think is my next slide. Um, yeah, you have to call an initialization after you put in this tuple. But once this is done, so you have someone submit this authorization list, and then you have yourself or someone else relay the initialization, the code that's pointed to at each address can be executed by the person you've delegated it to. And this is really, really cool because that's an arbitrary piece of code. And so they can do stuff that you've allowed them to do, which is smart contracts. And that might be sounding really abstract. I probably went too fast still, despite my efforts to slow down. Um, one thing that's really, really important is that uh, what you delegate the code to, it should be what you want it to do. And here's my call to action. This is the main reason I want to give this talk at this venue rather than just a technical deep dive of what's going on, because I think other people have covered it better, is that when I say someone can execute that code on your behalf, I'd like to see some of that code. And I was looking around for a while, and I didn't see a lot of that code. There are some examples. I think Coinbase has a couple. Um, I think Open Zeppelin is going to work on some. I saw some tweets. But I haven't seen a whole lot right now. And there are test nets out there that actually do support um, EIP7702. I forget on the networks, but if you look around, they are there. So we should really be at a point where we can say, I want to delegate my code to something that's well trusted. Because as someone who used to be a security researcher in this field, I think it's very important that you don't delegate code to something you don't trust. And the reality is the two or three or four use cases that I pointed to in the, last, in the first couple of slides of this talk are probably the most common and probably the ones that most of the people in this room and beyond really want to see batching, sponsorship, and social recovery. It's probably the biggest ones. And yet we don't have standards for the delegation code to actually run them. So I'd really like to see uh, some ideas of how that could look. Um, you know, it's a hackathon. Come build some. We don't technically have a prize for this at this one. But if you do deliver anything good, tag me or Dr. Z on Zirkut. And I'd be happy to take a look um, for reasons I'll explain in the next couple of slides. Either way, I think this is a good project this time, even if it's not quite as sort of you know, sexy or on hype as AI or DeFi or other things. Because at the end of the day, this might actually onboard people quicker than an AI that does something else. 
but part of that concern is security. Um, so the delegation of your uh, account to other people or parts of it um, is risky. So you know this is the reason I want to see stuff early because if we develop the stuff early and then it fails, well we can fix it for later users. So let's get started. Um, ideally we don't have any issues, but probably we will. Uh, nonetheless, if you do start doing this, be careful. Um, if you delegate to a proxy contract, it can upgrade itself. Now you're delegating sort of arbitrary powers. That might be very, very desirable. Maybe you trust the person. Maybe you want the ability to update that in some way. In other cases, I'm guessing in a lot of cases, you don't want to do that. That might be very scary because the person you delegate to can arbitrarily update their code and then, uh-oh, you've got to, you know, worry about if they can do something bad or something that you didn't want them to do. Um, for now, I would then rec therefore recommend keeping the delegated code simple. You know, choose one action and delegate to different people different actions. This way it's easy to audit, this way it's easy to understand, and this way you know what rights you're delegating away. Um, I also think that we should practice and sort of work with the idea of removing delegation access. Um, there is a way to overwrite that list so that delegation goes away. And I think this is important. I think in, in the past we've seen a lot of hacks where people said, uh, re revoke your approvals, revoke your approvals. I bet you're going to see you know, similar things, maybe on a smaller scale, about revoking delegated access, either because the person you delegated to is not trustworthy or because the code that's been at that address um, is problematic itself. And then finally, if you're building just any other DAP out there, um, be aware that now with the introduction of VIP 7702, the invariant that um, TX origin should be the message sender is no, no longer going to hold. So if you're using that to check if something's an EOA, you're out of luck after VIP 7702. You got to do something else. So all of these things should be sort of considered, um, and this is the time to do it. And that brings us to what we're going to do next with it. So Zerk it's a zero knowledge rollup. Um, if you're familiar with us, great. If not, um, we're a zero knowledge rollup with some nice features. And we're standing by to be one of the first to adopt 7702 as soon as it goes live. Um, our new testnet, which is going to be coming out very, very soon, um, sometime this week for sure, possibly in the next couple of hours, um, will be going live. And while it won't actually support um, 7702 just now, as soon as Spectra goes live on mainnet, uh, or sorry, Maybe not mainnet. Sometime very, very soon, we're going to have support for this. Um, possibly before Ethereum mainnet is actually what I'm trying to say. And what this will also mean is that uh, Zerkit, where we ha uh, Zerkit unique feature of sequencer level security, where we actually look for malicious transactions in the network, will also be adapted to look for malicious 7702 transactions. So this will include um, delegating things to people that you shouldn't be delegating or you know, problems in that delegation code. And that's really exciting. It's going to take us a little bit longer to get that online, but honestly, we're really excited, and I think that'll be an extra level of security. So almost out of time. What's next? Well, for 7702, it's got to go live. Um, Pectra is supposed to go live on Holski today. Uh, I don't know if that's happened yet. I haven't looked. I was too busy practicing the talk. Uh, on March 5th, it's going to go live on Sepolia. That's really cool. Uh, at some point then, on that day, if everything goes well, or shortly after that day, uh, people will decide when the mainnet launch of Pectra will be, and that will include um, 7702. And so it'll come very soon, probably a month or so after, I think is what I heard. So free IP 7702. If you have any comments about the technical implementations, better get them in real quick, because it's going live. For Ethereum, the road to abstract ac uh, uh, account abstraction is not done here. 772 is a great first step, but maybe we still want 4337 or something like it in order to get native AA, and that would be really cool. There's going to be a lot of work here, but getting used to 7702 is helpful. And then for you as an end user, the call to action is twofold. First, come up with some good delegation code here at Denver. I think that's really exciting. I'd really like to see it. And second, as soon as networks, particularly Zerkit, start to deploy 7702, test and play around with it. See what works. See what doesn't work. See what breaks. See what doesn't break. I'm not saying you're going to break the network, but I want to see those delegation code things break when it's a test run, not when someone puts a lot of money in it and we have to have a bad Twitter thread and people calling for rollbacks of chains, which is not so great. So for now, play around, be aware, learn, use. That's all I've got to say. So thank you. If you have any questions about me, 7702 or Zerkit, come talk to me. I'll be at a booth here or a table over there or hit me up on email or Telegram or Twitter and check out Zerkit. Thank you.